Welcome back guys to another episode. We are now at episode 4 looking at the story of James. We're going to break down James's character and look at a few lessons we can learn from his life as a disciple of Jesus. This is the character and story of James. So let's, let's break down James's character a little bit, okay? So first thing we can point out with James is that he was the older brother to John. This is why when we look at the lists that are named um, at the previous list that we looked at in the weeks before, when the disciples are listed from 1 to 12, we see often James is coming in at this second spot. So we know that there was maybe a closer relationship between John and Jesus. However, we still see James's name appear before John's name. And this is very most likely because he was the older brother. All right. Another thing we want to remind ourselves in this is that James was part of that inner circle of Jesus, part of the innermost three. And so we know he was there at the transfiguration and at many other events where Jesus significantly pointed out his relationship with these three. Okay. Now looking at him and maybe some words and to describe the character of James, the word that stands out the most for James is this word passion. We can see in the book of Mark that James and John together are called the sons of thunder. And this adds to this characteristic of being this extremely passionate, fiery character. All right. So, yeah, what we can also see in, in Mark, we can see that Mark is the only book that points out this nickname, the sons of thunder, to James and John. And finally, when we make a comparison between Andrew, who we saw last week, who tended to be much more of a passive character who brought people to Jesus, we can see in total contrast to that, James is much more condemning and fiery in his approach. And we see that he even wishes for, for Jesus to burn down villages. You know, wherever he sees something he disagrees with or people groups that he despises like the Samaritans, immediately his response is, oh, we need to... We need to cast them out. We need to burn them up. They need to be wiped from existence. And so there's this very aggressive nature in James as well, in being one of the sons of thunder. So that's wrapping up, looking at James and his character. What can we learn from James's life? So guys, we've just looked at the character of James and how John is very much the same in his passion and zeal for the Lord that they go to the degree of wanting harm to come to those who they identify as their enemies. But guys, this doesn't paint the full picture of James and John. And we're going to get further into looking at their character. But sticking with this idea, looking at their passion and looking at, at their wishing of negativity on on their enemies we're going to look a bit deeper at how jesus deals with james and john in these incidences and so i want you guys to turn your bibles to luke 9 verse 54 we're going to read that quickly to break this down a bit more so 54 reads in my esv and when his disciples james and john saw it they said lord do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them but he turned and rebuked them and they went on to another village. So guys, this is talking about James and John and the disciples of Jesus all coming into Samaria, into a town where there are very many Samaritans. Now, for those of you who don't know, Samaritans are very much probably the most hated nation by the Jews in this time. I would even say to this current day, there are still issues between Samaritans and Jews. And... I don't want to go too much into the history there, but this is very much because there was a split off in history. There was a time where there were Jews that started living with and getting married to non-Jews. And so to the Jewish nation, that split off became known as the Samaritans because they were now Jews who had then started life again with non-Jews, with pagans, people who didn't believe in God. So this is why there's this hatred between James and John, who are very staunch Jews, and now these Samaritans. So I hope that just gives us a little bit of clarity as to why they would have had such hate and wanted to wish so much harm. What we can see from this passage is that James and John are referring to an Old Testament passage when they make this reference of bringing down fire onto these Samaritans, you know, wishing for them to be consumed by heaven. In 2 Kings chapter 1 from verses 1 to 17. 
Many, many men, many soldiers come out to get to Elijah. He doesn't run away or try and defend himself. Instead, Elijah stands and as they call him and say, Are you the man of God? Come out if you're the man of God. And then he says, Truly, if I'm the man of God, you know, fire will come down upon you. And in these instances, on a number of occasions after many, many soldiers are sent after Elijah, they burn up in an instant. So you can very quickly see why John and James would have made this reference. People who they consider not of God, in other words, their enemies, they wish to perish in the same way that Elijah had made these soldiers perish. But what's different, guys? What's different is the context is completely different. We're not dealing with an enemy that's coming to try and slay the kingdom of God in the same way that people are coming after Elijah. But instead, it is the kingdom of God that Jesus is bringing to the people. And we know that Jesus brought a gospel of love and peace and kindness. And the significance in that is that if we look at that message, don't you think that's completely contrast to a message of just wishing that God would abolish his enemies? And I want us to recognize that it's a different time and a different purpose. And also, it wasn't Elijah's call. This was God's power. Does James and John really have the right grounds to stand on in trying to make such a claim? And in truth, we can say no. That's not their decision to make. And we know to this day, when we look at how we can interpret and understand God's love and His justice, He has called us, His people, to love and to be His vessels in, in society, in leading people to a life of knowing Him. The scriptures, yes, they do speak of judgment. And they do speak of these uh, moments where God's judgment is rained down on societies and on people groups and on kingdoms. However, it's not the same today because of Jesus. And if we even go back in the Old Testament and keep with the Old Testament scriptures, I don't want us to get the wrong idea that the Old Testament is all full of judgment and doom and gloom and then all of a sudden Jesus came and now we're talking about love. But the Old Testament likewise also spoke of love. When we look at Exodus 34 verse 6, we see a passage speaking about loving kindness. So let's read that passage together. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord of God, merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty. So guys, that's just a, a passage going into Old Testament among many passages that remind us that God's love and His desire for the wicked to know Him never dispersed, it never went away. And John and James, we can see, are clearly missing this. It's so easy as a human being just to say, oh, these people, we can just forget about them. It's not important to focus on them. They're already lost. It's so easy to say that, guys. Imagine we as Christians sat with a chart and said, no, these parts of the world, these people hate Jesus, these people hate Jesus, these people hate Jesus. Away with them, we're only going to focus on the people who have a chance of knowing Him. No. Missionaries don't work that way. They go into every nook and cranny of the world, to places where many of the time they are persecuted for sharing the message of Christ. So what does that say, guys? That this mindset is wrong. There's no such thing as nobody who's worthy because Jesus died for everyone. Everybody has that capacity. Everybody has the ability to know Jesus and therefore have an eternity with God. So guys, it's abundantly clear that James was not only fervent, passionate, zealous, and insensitive, but he was also ambitious and overconfident. And so if we can read from this passage in Matthew 20, from verses 20 to 24, we see a story unfold where James and John are requested by their mother Requested to be seated on the left and right hand of Jesus' throne. So let's read the story and see. So from verse 20 it reads, Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to him with, the, with her sons. And kneeling before him, she asked him for something. And he said to her, What do you want? She said to him, Say that these two sons of mine are to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your kingdom. And so Jesus answered, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? 
they said to him, we are able. He said to them, you will drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand and at the left is not mine to grant. But it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my father. And when the ten heard it, they were indignant at the two brothers. They're requesting of something, number one, that they don't actually know they're asking for. And secondly, Jesus says he cannot give them what they're asking for. It's not his place to give it to them. It is the Father's place. And so immediately the disciples respond in disgust. They're upset. They're like, you know, how dare you try and put yourself above the rest of us? Can you not see that we're equal? So guys, what can we learn from this? We can learn that for Jesus, it's not important what status we have. There's no real value in trying to rank up in God's kingdom. There is no ranking system of who the worst of Jesus' disciples are or who the best are. It's important to see that even though these three disciples stood out so much, and right now in this point we see James and John trying to make themselves stand out, Jesus' intention isn't for some to be valued more than others. And guys, that's the point. It's not about this. It's never ever about what status we have, how valuable we are to Jesus, because we all have the same value to Him. I now want to read from the book that we've been using on page 91. And John MacArthur says here at the bottom, James wanted a crown of glory. Jesus gave him a cup of suffering. He wanted power. Jesus gave him servanthood. He wanted a place of prominence, whilst Jesus gave him a martyr's grave. He wanted to rule. Jesus gave him a sword, not to wield, but to be an instrument of his own execution. Fourteen years after this, James would become the first of the twelve to be killed for his death. And so what we see in this as well, guys, is that they didn't understand. They didn't recognize what they were even asking for. They knew not what they were asking for. And so likewise, we as Christians, we need to know what life we are walking into when we consider ourselves believers. We need to know what we are called to. Sometimes we are called to struggle, to persecution, to difficulty. And a lot of the time, the Christian life is like that. You're not in it for yourself at the end. And that's the point here. When we say we want to be servants of the Lord... We're saying that because we want to honor our Creator. We want to honor our Father in Heaven who has given us this abundant life. Who does desire good for us. But it does mean there are difficulties to come. There is going to be pushback. And it's not going to be easy. And that's what the message was here for James. Wrapping up. So in wrapping up, guys, I don't want us to get a distorted or wrong understanding of James. We've been looking at a lot of the negative attributes of James, coming from that passion and from that wish for destruction on his enemies. But there's a lot we can learn from this and a lot that James did learn from this. So I want you guys to now make reference to Matthew 25 from verse 14 to 30. And here we're looking at the parable of the talents. Now, for those of you who don't know of this parable, just to summarize it, in this parable, we have five servants of a master and each are given a number of coins. With one is given five, one is given two, and one is given one coin. Five, two, and one. And they are asked to hold on to this for the master. The servants with the five talents and the two talents go and double what they have. They've invested in it. They've taken risks. And they've resulted in getting more for their master. So that's something their master applauds. However, the final servant, the final servant who only got given one talent, decided to go and bury his talent. Thought it was too risky to try and lose that one talent that he had and rather try to save it. And this is the servant that the master comes back and says, How dare you do this? Why haven't you tried to do anything with this like the other two servants? And so the message is quite clear from this parable. The message is we need to put ourselves out there and try and make an impact. Taking this idea and looking at James and saying, Would it have been better for Jesus to, instead of picking James, this passionate person, or would it have been wiser for Jesus? Would it have been wiser for Jesus to pick someone more timid, laid back and held back and reserved, not actually going forward and leading? And so what we see in this is James is still a very significant leader character. 
his leadership is still very much valued by Jesus. Being the older brother of John, even a leader to his own brother. As we mentioned earlier, that's why he's second on the listings that we see of the 12 disciples. So Jesus put his trust in James because he would fervently serve him. He wouldn't hold back on anything that Jesus would ask him to do. He knew if he asked James to do something, no matter what the risk, no matter what would be at stake, James would do what he was told and he would do it to the best of his ability. Now I'm not saying guys we need to go and take risks everywhere and be unthoughtful and do the wrong things. At the end of the day we need God's guidance, we need his will to be clear for us to follow. But that's the point. As soon as we know God's will for our lives, there should be nothing holding us back from trying to fulfill the will that God has put on our hearts. And that's what James is teaching us. If there's something you're tasked to do, do it to the best of your ability. Believe it or not, the goal is to go and make mistakes. Every single one of us are going to stuff up like James. Every single one of us are going to have preconceptions and misconceptions of how this world works. Things holding us back from fully serving God and fully portraying His love and kindness in this world. But how are we going to learn if we don't go out and do it? How are we going to learn if we don't go and make mistakes? So it's a funny lesson, but go make mistakes, guys. That's the point here. Because if you're not making any mistakes, it means you're not even trying. Jesus teaches us to be loving and kind. We all have Samaritans in our lives in sh any shape, way, or form that is, is particular to us. And we need to learn to be loving and being kind to those people. Secondly, we're not supposed to be entitled. We need to be prepared for hardship in knowing that it's not going to be about us. We're not going to suffer and go through all this hardship to elevate ourselves. But it's all going to be in the name of Jesus and finally don't be afraid to make mistakes guys go out do your best and learn from the mistakes that you make it's the only way you're going to grow thank you so much guys that's going to wrap it up for this week I hope that this concise and impactful lesson about James really just speaks into your hearts I know for me sometimes I am hesitant in going forward and I don't want to make mistakes but sometimes it's the best way to learn. And we need to take those risks. But finally and most importantly, let's not do it in hate. Let's not go out and spread hate. But let's go out and spread the love of Jesus. And let's do it in a way where we're not elevating ourselves. But we're elevating our Lord and Savior. That's what it's about. So thanks again for your time. Thanks again for joining me this morning, this afternoon, whenever you're with me today. And I hope and pray that you have a blessed week. Thanks again, guys. Cheers.